Hey, hello guys. Uh, hope I'm audible and visible. If so, say me a hi. Hello, if you guys are online. Okay. I hope I'm audible and visible. So, hey guys, welcome back. I'm seeing you all of you after quite some time. Hello, Suresh. Uh, good evening. Hope you're doing good. So let's continue the Faraj series. I am I am sure that uh, your uh, pharmacology and microbiology Faraj is done with, and uh, we have a little bit of uh, classes left. I'll complete uh, kind of try to complete renal today, and in the next class I'll be completing the male and female gender system so that uh, there is some amount of resources for you if you are starting to prepare for a second year of MBBS. They should be little bit at least scratching the top. Fine. Need with Desi. Good evening. How are you? So let's start without any much of a delay. So we'll be starting with uh, nephritic and nephrotic syndrome difference. So let's, uh, you are close to exams, right? So can you guys comment when your exams are? If some of you watching here as from second year of MBBS, when is your university exam? Hello, Samranya Hathi. When is your second year university exams? Have they given the timetable or it's happening? It's happened. What's the status? So I'm sure quite a few of your exams must have been started or on the go or maybe in near future. Tomorrow, wow, Pavitra, Feb, middle, Harshwadhan, great, your time. Okay, Jan 19, right. So you must have already done with all these topics, either in the routine part of reading and maybe sometimes by revision as well. Hi, Sagar, good evening, doctor, come all around. So what we're going to do is you're going to have, I'll create you some tables. I want you guys to comment on it and fill it so that you take this session as a revision come learning session, fine? I like Dr. Kamal Rodner, we'll both learn as well as revise in the session. We'll start with nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. We'll have a very basic difference between nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. I'm sure most of you guys know already, right? So let's divide them uh, as usual, uh, t tabular column, which most of us don't like, right? We have nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome. See the basic difference between nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. What, is, what do you think, what do you think guys are the basic difference? Tell me what is the amount of proteinuria in nephrotic syndrome? Massive or cell, um, not massive? Good evening, Gaurav. Nephrotic syndrome has a very massive proteinuria, right? Perfect. Nephrotic syndrome will have a proteinuria of greater than 3.5 grams per day. So that is not the most important determining factor for nephrotic syndrome because nephritic syndrome also have proteinuria. It will have less protein here, fine, great is where, as protein, perfect. So nephritic syndrome will have 1 to 2 grams per day protein here. Please don't forget, it's per day protein here. It's not per milligram per deciliter, it's per day. So an entire day, 3.5 grams and above will be lost in nephrotic syndrome and 1 to 2 gram or sometimes even less than 1 gram can be uh, lost in nephritic syndrome. The main difference between nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome, at least for your level is, which of these do you think is selective? Can you guys comment on it? Only Sagar has commented so far. I want you guys to comment on whatever you know. Right, wrong, doesn't matter at all. Which you think is selective proteinuria? Nephrotic or nephritic? Perfect, right? Nephrotic syndrome is selective proteinuria. Nephritic syndrome is mostly a non-selective proteinuria. When I say selective proteinuria, which protein do you think will be excreted? Uh, no, uh, Hathi, you'll, you'll have your own time. Don't worry. We'll see it soon. Perfect. Which which protein do you think will be selectively excreted? Albumin, globulin, anything in particular? Perfect. It'll be albuminuria specifically, right? So it'll be primarily albuminuria, but here it's a non-selective protein. Yeah? Almost every serum plasma protein can be excreted, right? It's not just the albuminuria that's a problem. If you remember nephrotic syndrome, the first symptom which comes to your mind, can anyone comment on what is the symptom which comes to your mind first when you think of nephrotic syndrome? you end up in having edema, right? So when albumin is lost in the urine, the serum albumin levels will be reduced or elevated. Hathi will definitely announce you that uh, in the next couple of days, we'll announce a new batch. When albumin is lost, perfect, it'll result in reduced serum albumin, right? So you'll have reduced serum albumin or it'll end up in having hypoalbuminemia. This hypoalbuminemia like you remember in your physiology of uh, the oncotic pressure will be reduced. When the oncotic pressure is reduced, the fluid goes outside. Perfect. You'll have edema. And can anyone comment here, renal related edema, because edema can be due to cardiac failure, can be due to liver failure, and also can be due to renal failure. Renal related edema, which part of the body it will be there? Perfect. It will be in the periorbital area or in facial puffiness. It's loose connective tissue. The reduction in the pressure is not that much enough to push the flu fluid in the foot. It will be in the periorbital area. It will be putting in the periorbital area. Right. Perfect. Great. So now, see, this is one part of nephrotic syndrome. The massive selective proteinuria which everyone will write. 
that's not enough for a three mark or five mark question. We'll have to little bit learn a little bit more. It's not just albumin. There are many other proteins which are going to be destroyed, right? So when I say many other proteins, uh, many other proteins will be lost. One of them is your transferrin. Transferrin will also get lost. So tell me, this might not be something which you must have read in Robin. This might give you an extra edge in an exam. Transferrin will be lost. So what will the patient end up with having? The patient will end up in having iron refractory iron deficiency anemia. Okay, we'll write here itself what will be the problem because of this. It's an iron deficiency anemia, but iron refractory. What do I mean by iron refractory is transferrin is lost. If I give this patient oral iron, do you think it will work? It won't work, right? It will never work because there is no transferrin. So I have to give an injectable form of iron. So iron transferrin uh, plus transferrin also should be given in this patient. Iron refractory, iron deficiency anemia. That's very, very important. On In addition to this, it's not just transferrin. I lose one more important protein as well, which will be your antithrombin 3. As the name indicates, antithrombin 3 is going to be anti to thrombin, right? So it's procoagulant or anticoagulant? What do you think antithrombin 3 will do? Procoagulant activity or anticoagulant activity? Come on, you guys know that. You will be able to comment on it. Perfect. If it's antithrombin is a anticoagulant, right? So if I'm losing antithrombin 3 in the urine, what will happen to the patient? The patient will have more amount of coagulation or this results in a prothrombotic state. I'm losing an anticoagulant, so which results in a prothrombotic state. This is very important. The reason I am saying this is very important is you might have an essay question in nephrotic syndrome. If it's an essay question in nephrotic syndrome, you might have a random history of thrombus somewhere in the body with protein losing nephropathy. Think of a nephrotic syndrome. That's very important. That's why it's an indirect link, but I'm sure it's very, very important for us. Fine. Again, I'll add one more thing here. This again might not be there in your textbooks. If you're with me in the second year uh, uh, entire lecture, this must have been there ingrained in your head. When you take a glomerular filtration barrier or the membrane which separates the blood and the urine, we have an endothelium, we add basement membrane and we add epithelium, right? So most of the time, the pathogenesis part of nephrotic syndrome will be loss of the food process or damage to the food process will result in nephrotic syndrome, fine? Okay, so don't worry. If you are writing this, okay. If you are not writing it, it's completely fine. Damage to food process is going to result in nephrotic syndrome. Just remember this alone, fine. This for us for extrapolating multiple diseases. And I, whenever a disease is asked, classification between nephrotic and nephrotic, just don't stop with that. Give one or two examples. It doesn't hurt, right? So the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children and in adults. I just want you to end with this, though it's a, just a difference between nephrotic and nephrotic syndrome. Let's introduce the diseases also to the examiner, right? So comment, tell me what is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome. I'm sure you guys know that. The common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children? Perfect, right? Great Pratik, it's minimal changes or an MCD. What's the common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults? Pratik, can you answer or someone else? Ishwar, Pavitra, Sagar? Uh, PEM, I won't say it's cause of nephrotic syndrome, it can be protein losing, right? Great Pratik, FSGS. The most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and in children obviously it's your minimal chain disease. Just end with that, so it'll have a complete idea of, okay, this person knows about the diseases and also the pathogenesis and also about the symptomatology, fine? That's one part. Now let's go to nephrotic pathology. So what happens in nephrotic syndrome is, none of this happens. I'm going to have proteinuria. It might be less than 1, 1 plus, 2 plus, but never 3 plus or more than 3.5. And it's non-selective protein. Everything, every serum protein has the capability to be destroyed. Okay. And what is the important feature of nephrotic syndrome? Like I have albuminuria for nephrotic. What do you think is the classical feature of nephrotic syndrome? It's your rate. It's your hematuria. Okay. That's the most classical feature of nephrotic syndrome. If blood is going to be lost, let's just assume for an example, I'm having a random capillary which has been cut and I'm bleeding. I'm going to bleed. What will happen to the blood pressure? Not leave the kidney bleeding. I'm having a bleeding from the finger or from the hand. If there's going to be bleeding, what will happen to the blood pressure? Automatically will increase. This hematuria will disturb the autoregulation and the patient will have hypertension. Hypertension and hematuria are a classical combination seen in patients with nephritis syndrome. Please don't forget that. The uh, Karigan, ex Karigan. You'll have a drop in pressure when you're having a huge amount of hemorrhage to compensate that. That's why I said autoregulation is going to get stimulated and result in hypertension. That's what happens here, fine? Perfect, blood and urine, okay? So in addition to hematuria, I want you to add one more feature. In microscopy, the RBCs will be dysmorphic. 
This is very, very important. This might fetch you more mark for sure. I'll tell you what do you mean by dysmorphic RBCs and why it is important, okay? Um, tell me if whatever I'm going to say is right or wrong. UTI can cause hematuria, yes or no? Bladder calculi or cystitis can cause hematuria, yes or no? It obviously can, right? So I have cystitis, I have UTA, and also I have nephritic syndrome. All of these three can cause hematuria. So I need to differentiate how is it an UTI causing blood or it is a nephritic syndrome causing blood. When I say nephritic syndrome causing blood, the source of this bleeding is glomerulus. So from glomerulus, it goes to the tubules, it goes to the renal pelvis, ureter, bladder, urethra comes outside. Can I say it's a very long journey and there's a chance the RBCs might become altered in appearance? Yes, it can be damaged, right? Since glomerulus till your urethra, it's a very long journey. So because of this, you'll have a damaged RBC or a dysmorphic. This is abnormal morphology, the morph morphic is morphology, right? An abnormal shaped RBC, this reiterates the thing that the source of the bleeding is glomerulus and not the peripheral UTI. This is a very important finding. Do write them in microscopy is not just hematuria with dysmorphic RBCs. That's one side there, fine? Okay. In addition to this, nephritic syndrome uh, will have, when I look at the pathogenesis, it will have damage to the GBM. Okay? Any disease which damages your glomerular basement membrane will result in nephritic syndrome. Nephritic syndrome not necessarily will be associated with your uh, uremia or your creatine elevation. Yes, most of the time, nephritic syndrome has more chance of having a little bit of renal failure compared to nephrotic syndrome. Fine? Great. Okay. So, like I said, examples are important. Can anyone tell me one class, at least one classical examples for uh, nephritic syndrome? I'm sure you know more than one classical example. At least one classical example. One classical example for nephritic syndrome. Perfect is your PSGN or PIGN. Post streptococcus glomerular nephritis, post infectious glomerular nephritis. Please try to include IgA nephropathy as well. Because IgA nephropathy is one of the recurrent cause of nephritic syndrome. Uh, most common cause of glomerular nephritis in the world. L include these two as well. Fine. Hi, fun with Dhru. Hopefully you're doing good. Fine. Okay. These are few basic differences between nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. Like I said, asotemia. Asotemia is nothing but the increase in the creatinine bun creatinine ratio is a bit more common here compared to nephrotic syndrome. I am not saying that renal failure will never happen in nephrotic syndrome. It will happen. But here it's a little bit more common compared to your nephrotic syndrome. Fine. So these are basic differences. And the first question, what you are going to discuss in the kidney pathology. The difference between nephrotic syndrome and nephrotic syndrome. Fine. Any doubts? If any doubts, let me know. If no doubts, we can go ahead. Okay, so no one is asking any doubts. If you have any doubts regarding nephrotic nephrotic, let me know. Otherwise, we'll go to the next one. This also is a very important question, cystic kidney disease. There's a very high chance, even if it doesn't come in an exam as a theory question, I'm sure most of your colleges will have the specimens, right? How to, uh, of uh, ADPKD or ARPKD and you will have to learn that. Uh, yes, Sajaya, there'll be a thing, uh, class, uh, prof, live batch for sure, we'll be announcing it in a couple of days. Puffy, puffy morphological difference, when I say morphological difference, you mean the microscopic finding? Microscopic finding is totally based on the disease. I cannot say exactly nephrotic will have this morphology nephrotic, it's based on the disease, you'll have the difference, fine? Hello Azia and hello Dhruv. Okay, let's go to um, cystic kidney disease. So cystic kidney disease, like I said, it's both useful for your practical examination, the viva question which you have specimens, and also it can come as a long answer question, fine? Uh, yes, Sagar. See, nephritic syndrome is simple. I'm going to have a damage to the GBM. Because of the damage to the GBM, your RBC goes outside. Because of the blood loss, there's going to be compensatory hypertension. And whenever the damage to the GBM happens, the protein also can go outside, but it's very non-selective. Edema might happen, but less. Renal failure is a bit more common than nephrotic syndrome. See, diuretics for nephrotic, sy nephrotic syndrome. If more than diuretics, I would say, go and target the problem, right? If I'm going to target the main disease, that will help you in treating the disease. Like MCD, I give steroids rather than having diuretics, right? It's a damaged kidney. I'm not going to force them to uh, give diuretics and make them function a little bit more. So target the disease, target the etiology, treat that. If required, yes, diuretics might be required. Again, I'm not the right person to talk about diuretics. I'll leave it to your medicine faculty when Dr. Santosh comes to your final year. He'll explain more about treatment of nephrotic and nephrotic syndrome. Fine? Sure, Rajya, same here. Okay, let's go to the next one. Cystic kidney disease. 
So cystic kidney disease, the first and the foremost thing, cystic kidney disease is completely a gross diagnosis. There's no microscopic finding in most of the cystic kidney disease except for one or two. Rest, everything is completely a gross diagnosis. If you know the gross, you can easily diagnose almost every case of cystic kidney disease. Having said that, if I have to group cystic kidney diseases, I'm sure you must have known about the ADPKD and ARPKD. Let's group cystic kidney diseases in a different way. I want to classify cystic kidney disease just for diagnosis. I'll have cysts in cortex and medulla, in both cortex and medulla. Predominantly, this will be your ADPKD and your ARPKD. Since I said it's mostly a gross diagnosis, I look at the place of cyst. Then I can easily say, okay, it's an ADPKD, it's an ARPKD. Then I have cyst in your corticomedullary junction. I have cyst in corticomedullary junction. I have a disease called the medullary sponge kidney. I'll show you an image. It's an amazing uh, image of a medullary sponge kidney. And I have a disease called as a nephronophthesis. Nephronophthesis. Okay. That's, uh, it's a very vast disease, but just for remembering the namesake, fine. Okay, Rashmi Rekha. All the very best. Fine. And I have predominantly cortical cysts. When I say predominantly cortical cysts, I'm going to divide them into two diseases. Acquired cystic disease and simple renal cyst. When I say predominantly cortex, uh, cortical cyst, doesn't mean that it should be there only in the cortex. I can see sometimes a simple renal cyst having cyst in the medulla. These are predominant findings, a gross differential diagnosis, that's all. So if you have a jar mounted specimen in your college, explain where the cyst is present. Because that will give you an uh, the examiner understanding, okay, this person knows what he or she is talking about. I have an enlarged kidney with cyst in both cortex and medulla, which means you are going towards ADPKD or ARPKD. I have a single cyst predominantly in the cortex, which means you're talking about your simple renal cyst or an acquired renal cyst. That's a basic way of differentiating since it's completely a gross diagnosis, right? And we have few diagnostic points for every disorder, ADPKD and ARPKD. Robbins is an amazing table. If you can read the theory and remember the table, revise the table, that's more than enough. I'm just going to add a few more extra points to the existing table, which I am sure you already know, right? It's an ADPKD inheritance is autosomal dominant. We'll use the same template. Templates are very simple and easy to reproduce as well. It's an autosomal dominant inheritance. Whenever there's an any disease, which is autosomal dominant inheritance, when do you think the patient will present? Early in life, at birth or later in life? That's a template for every autosomal dominant disorder. When will they present? When do you think they'll present? Sorry, they'll present later in life, right? So the age of presentation of ADPKD, ARPKD is generally around 40 to 45 years. They present later in life. They don't present early in life and they might present with an renal failure or hypertension. They might have renal failure later in life or they might end up in having a chest and hypertension later in life. That's true for every autosomal dominant disorder. They'll present later in life only. It's an autosomal dominant disorder. Every autosomal dominant disorder will not affect only one organ. Take Marfan syndrome. It can affect your eye, it can affect your, uh, your uh, blood vessels, it can affect your joints, many places. This ADPKD also will affect multiple places. You'll have other symptoms. The symptomatology, apart from your cystic kidney diseases, you'll have cysts in the liver, you can have cysts in pancreas, you can have cysts in lungs, you can have cysts in all of the places, right? Okay. And most importantly, I'll answer your question X Kerrigan. You'll also have a classical finding in your brain called as berry aneurysm. Please don't forget this. This is one of the most sorted association which we look for in the exam paper, berry aneurysm. It's simple. Why later in life? It's an autosomal dominant disorder. If it's an autosomal dominant disorder, one allele or one copy of the genus mutated. Other copy is still normal. Can it do the function for some time? It can. That's why every autosomal dominant disorder will play, present later in life. Every autosomal recessive disorder will present early in life. Fine. Okay. So when I take genetics, there are two genes which are involved in ADPKD. One is called as PKD1 and PKD2. The protein which they give us, polycystin 1 and 2. I hope it's clear, uh, Karikan. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Okay. Fine. So it's uh, PKD1 and PKD2, uh, which gives through proteins, polystin 1 and polystin 2. If you want to write the chromosomes, you can write again for an uh, university exam. I'm not going to be keenly looking into chromosomes. The polystin 1 and 2 is more than enough for me, fine? So here, like I said, the diagnosis basically based on gross. Gross, two findings. 
a very 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 large kidney they are not smaller they are extremely large kidney please do remember them fine second like i said cysts will be there in the outer surface and cut surface this is an extra finding and also you'll have cysts in cortex and medulla so th there are three ways to differentiate this okay you'll have cortex and medullary cyst I want you to remember all three of them. It's an extremely large kidney. The kidney can be in the size of like 10 kgs. It's very huge. And there's an image from Robbins. I'll just zoom this image. This first image here, which is given as an uncut kidney. Right? This kidney is not cut. Outer surface also I'm seeing cyst. When I cut the kidney also, the entire kidney is full of cyst. So the cut surface is also having a cyst. The outer surface is having a cyst. And the cut surface, you can see that clearly both the cortex and medulla is having the cyst. That's very, very classical. Why this is important is, we'll just compare this with ARPKD. Can I say in ARPKD, how many of you agree that? Can I say that the outer surface of ARPKD is smooth? It doesn't have cyst. Compare this to ADPKD. Does the outer surface have cyst here? Yes, right? So ARPKD outer surface will not have cyst. ADPKD outer surface will have cyst. That's a major difference here because both of them are both cortical and medullary cysts. So grossly, this was, this will be the one of the differential point for me. So uh, that's about ADPKD. Ends up in having a renal failure later in life. These are the few important pointers which I want you to remember in ADPKD. Then let's go to ARPKD, fine? Okay. So ARPKD, inheritance is autosomal recessive inheritance as the name says. Okay, uh, so it's an autosomal recessive inheritance. So when do you think they will present? Early in life, later in life. Just for understanding, autosomal recessive means both the copies of the gene are mutated. So they'll present early or late. They obviously will present early in life. So I have multiple subtypes of ARPKD. I call the ARPKD based on the time of presentation. You have something called perinatal ARPKD. You have neonatal ARPKD. You have infantile ARPKD. And sometimes, rarely, a bit of a late presentation, I have juvenile ARPKD, okay? And the gene mutated in ARPKD, it codes for a protein called as fibrocystin. It's a ciliary protein. And it's PKHD1 gene, fine? PKHD1, fine? Okay, great. So can anyone tell me any other feature of ARPKD apart from the cyst? Like ADPKD, I gave you a thing saying that it can have cyst in multiple organs and bury aneurysm. Do you know any other organ where cyst can be seen in ARPKD? Ap apart from the kidney, symptomatology, when I look, it's most likely a child with a renal failure. That will be the most likely presentation of ARPKD. It will be very early onset. The kid will have mm -hmm. renal failure. Perfect. I can have liver. Liver failure also can happen, right? Perfect. Great. So when I say liver failure, it can have cysts in the liver. Like uh, someone said, Afsal, Afsal said, and also I'll have one more thing. I can end up in having a congenital hepatic fibrosis. That's actually more dangerous than having a cyst. The cyst might not cause an absolute liver failure, but it's a fibrotic liver in a child. The child will not be able to cope at all, right? So they'll have a congenital hepatic fibrosis. This is also a very classical finding for an ARPKD, okay? Uh, ARPKD if untreated might become lethal, especially the perinatal forms and neonatal forms. I have to give something, I have to treat the patient, otherwise the patient might lose their life. Very young kid, the young kid cannot tolerate. And the way to diagnose here, outer surface will be smooth, there will be no cyst. That's the main difference between ADPKD and ARPKD. And on the cut surface, as already we know, I'll have cyst both in cortex and medulla. But there's a un uniqueness here, the cortical cyst will always be perpendicular to the surface. That's a very unique finding. It will be perpendicular surface and there will be oval cyst. Let, let me try to explain how it looks like. Okay, It will be like this. It will be like this. If you look at the image of Robbins, the table of Robbins is what would have been drawn. All the corticals will be elongated and will be perpendicular. Meet horseshoe kidney is something totally different anomaly. It's, an, it's nothing to do with ARPKD or ADPKD. I can have them in association, but it has nothing to do with the same pathogenesis, fine? Okay. And cut surface will have a cyst in the cortical thing and medulla will have normal cyst. Medullary cysts are not elongated. Medullary cysts are as usual round to oval, fine? There is no difference. It's like any other uh, cyst seen. Okay. This is a very unique finding. Try to draw this diagram because if you look at the Robbins table, this diagram is important and it's emphasis as well. I'll just try to zoom this up. Can you appreciate that? Is it possible or is it difficult to say that? If you can see, look at this cyst. Okay, It's very uniform. I have an elongated cyst. 
Here also I have an elongated cyst, right? All these cysts in the cortex are a bit elongated and they are perpendicular to the cortical surface, right? That's a very, very unique finding for an ARPKD. Elongated cysts perpendicular to the cortical surface. And if you go to the medulla, medulla cysts are round. I hope you can easily appreciate the difference between a cortical cyst and a medullary cyst in ARPKD. That's a very important diagnostic point. Please don't forget them, fine? So we know about ARPKD and ADPKD, right? Let's slowly jump into next disease called the medullary sponge kidney. Medullary sponge kidney, it's, the name is the beauty of the disease. It's like a sponge. It's very, very porous, very, very tiny cyst. Completely sporadic disease, no inheritance. Most of the time found incidentally. I'll show you an image. This is how medullary sponge kidney is. Can I say the uh, cyst looks like sponge? Very tiny, very, very tiny like a porosity of sponge. Look at this, they are very, very tiny cyst, right? So that's how medullary sponge kidney looks like. They are very, very tiny cyst looks like a sponge. That's why I call them a medullary sponge kidney. Here, it might not cause renal failure, but am I right in saying that these tiny sponges, okay, these tiny sponges, can they hold the urine for some time? It's like very spongy. Yes, so if they can hold the urine, just a logical explanation, just tell me, is there a chance of UTI? Or is there a chance of stone formation? Yes, no, just comment yes or no, that should be more than enough, because that will give me the clinical history, fine? It's a sporadic disease, come on, you guys are online, you have to comment, it's completely fine if you're wrong, don't worry about it that at all, okay? It's sporadic disease, most of the time, the symptomatology here will be UTI, Stone formation, okay, and hematuria. Both of them can cause the above finding, fine. Since it's stored for a longer time, it's urine sedimented there, not being absorbed, not being pushed outside. There's a chance the minerals can accumulate resilient stones. There's a chance organisms can grow resilient UTI. And because of both of them, you can end up in hematuria. These are the regular findings. And most of the time, medullary sponge kidneys are incidental diagnosis. Sometimes they'll be totally asymptomatic. You do an ultrasonogram for some other reason, you have cysts there in and around. That's how we diagnose them. Um, very rarely causes renal failure. Very rarely causes any renal related problem except for the UTI and infection, fine? It's a completely benign course. The uniqueness is the location of the cyst, corticomedullary junction predominantly, and the size of the cyst. It's spongy and tiny cyst, fine? Okay, next about cystic renal dysplasia. This is a very important disease. So cystic renal dysplasia, be it in, in a viva, if any of your examiner asks, say that uh, there's a newborn or a neonate with non-functioning kidney, or if you have an MCQ in university exam, newborn with a non-functioning kidney, there's a very important difference here. I'm having a newborn with non-functioning kidney. See, I didn't say renal failure. If you say newborn with renal failure, I'll think of an ARPKD. Here the kidney never functions at all. You see this phrase anywhere in the rest of your career, think of a cystic renal dysplasia. The kidney will never function because this is the kidney. Does it look like a kidney? It doesn't even look like a kidney, right? That's why I call it a cystic renal dysplasia. It's dysplastic. The kidney doesn't look like it at all. It's completely gone, fine? Okay. So cystic renal dysplasia, again, it's a very sporadic disease. It has no inheritance. It can be unilateral or bilateral. If bilateral, both the kidneys are not functioning. You need definitely treatment at the earliest, renal transplant at the earliest or replacement therapy, right? If bilateral, it needs replacement, renal replacement at the earliest. Because both the kidneys are not going to function. And they might even present in the intrauterine life also, fine? Okay. The reason why I call it cystic renal dysplasia is the gross, the cyst will entirely replace the kidney. I won't see any cyst here at all. Cyst replaces the entire kidney. That's the first thing. Okay. Second, in microscopy, it's dysplastic. It's not normal. It's abnormal. So what I see in microscopy is you will have immature elements. You'll have immature cartilages. It's a dysplastic kidney, right? It's not growing in the normal way. You can have immature glomeruli. Everything will be immature, nothing will be mature, right? So that's why it's cystic renal dysplasia. It's a sporadic disorder. Yes, renal failure is must. Treatment is must. Surgical removal of the kidney is must. Entirely irregular kidney, completely replaced by cyst, fine? This is how the cyst looks, grossly. 
you won't see even a single part of a nephron or normal kidney parenchyma here microscopy you can see this is actually a cartilage uh, both are images from robins you can see immature glomeruli here it's not mature yet that's an immature glomeruli fine right? uh, you need not write a, draw a diagram uh, if, unless it's until it's an essay question for a five mark question just give the few pointers that's more than enough fine right? okay last but not the least we have the acquired renal cyst and simple renal cyst both of them will have few words regarding both a simple renal cyst it's again a totally incidental diagnosis so how many of you ultrasonogram has been done have any one of you had an ultrasound abdomen or for you or for any of your family members we can do ultrasound abdomen for many many reasons liver problem they do uterine problem they might do right there are multiple places i can do an ultrasound abdomen incidentally i see a cyst and the radiologists reports that's all that's a cystic kidney disease uh, that's a simple renal cyst right predominant of them they are cortical cyst and predominant of the cyst are asymptomatic great See, you do ultrasound abdomen for many, many, many reasons, right? Mr. X, uh, if you are still in your first year, this might not be required for you. You will read them when you come to your second year, fine? Okay. So I'm having a tiny cortical cyst here. Let's assume there's a cortical cyst here. There's a cyst here on the surface of the thing. Is there a possibility same like what we saw in medullary sponge kidney? Chance of stone formation? Yes. Chance of hematuria? Yes. Chance of infection? Yes. Most of the time asymptomatic. If symptoms are there, it might be due to infection. The cyst can get infected or there can be a stone formation. Right? And there's a chance of rupture as well. So these are the complications. This does not result in cancer. It's completely a benign condition. It's completely a cystic lesion. Nothing will happen. If, if at all there's a complication, puncture the cyst, remove this. Otherwise, just leave, wait and watch. No treatment is required here at all. Fine. Okay. Okay. Then go to an acquired cystic disease. An acquired cystic kidney. Just give me a second. Okay. Can you hear me? Fine. Then acquired kidney disease. Yeah, my network has some issues. It's getting stuck. I hope it's better now. So this is seen in patients with secondary to hemodialysis. Okay. Patients secondary to hemodialysis, you have an acquired cystic kidney disease. Right? Okay, I think it's much better here. Fine. So this Acquired cystic kidney disease, the only problem with acquired cystic disorders, it will end up in having, it increases the risk of renal cell carcinoma, increases the risk of papillary RCC to be specific, right? There'll be more risk of papillary RCC, that's one of the important concerns of an acquired cystic kidney. Can you guys see me and can you guys hear me? Okay. So when do I suspect a papillary RCC is? In a cyst, whenever there's a solid area in a cyst, you're going to suspect the confirmation or transformation into an papillary renal cell carcinoma, fine. So uh, any patient who is on hemodialysis will be required to do a regular uh, ultrasonogram whenever the patient comes for hemodialysis. Whenever there's a tiny, whenever there's a tiny solid area in the cyst, you suspect an acquired, uh, acquired cystic